What is going on YouTube? Bitwise Guy here coming to you with another Rust tutorial, but I've got all my editing software in order. I'm using Caden Live now, a uh, bit of Audacity, and um, to kind of up my video editing quality and whatever else, I thought I would do a little something different at the start of this video. So what we're going to be doing is going through some comments and I'm going to be answering some comments that you guys have posted on my previous videos uh, and also going through some of the feedback, uh, which I always really appreciate. So the first thing is uh, a comment comes from Dan Purser. He says, considering the naming conventions for Rust, uh, and he's referenced the naming conventions on doc.rust-lang.org, the local variables and fields should not be camel case, but snake case, isn't it? Well, Dan, you are absolutely correct. The documentation does reference it. However, in my video, I had mentioned that although the uh, documentation specifies to use snake case, I prefer to always use camel case. Now, over the over the past couple of weeks, I have. I have become more accustomed to snake case. However, from a syntactically aesthetic point of view, I am not a fan of snake case as I feel like it clutters up the entire code base, if you will. Um, but you may run into some issues with uh, modules and plugins that expect uh, your modules to look like snake case or whatever, uh, if they're using it to uh, separate the words or whatever. The next comment comes from Aram Grigoryuran. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. I'm sure I did. Uh, he says, My QT creator complains that it cannot find the dlibs, the debug libs. Um, well, I would recommend that you re-download the SFML library. Um, he says that he's downloaded it for the Linux 64-bit package. Uh, that is indeed the uh, distribution of Linux that I'm running. I'm running on Ubuntu 64-bit, uh, so with Linux and the latest Linux kernel. Um, it had the debug it had the debug libs in it, so I'm not exactly sure what is going on there. But I will have a look into that, and I might even put up a video just for you. Uh, the next few comments actually come from a user called ATF300T. I feel like that was meant to be a foot, but it kind of didn't happen for him. Uh, he says, Rust has the return keyword. For example, you can write this, and he's got an example of a function that returns an int32 and then an explicit return of a 9, which is an integer. Absolutely correct, ATF300T. Rust does have the return keyword. However, Rust also has implicit returns, which are specified by the lack of a semicolon. So it's really up to you. However, the kind of Rust standard uh, generally just does implicit return types. Uh, I don't really ever see the uh, return keyword being used, whether it's in the compiler <clears throat> or other people's code. So hopefully that answers your question. His next question is, there is one more thing that appears unusual for many programmers. Try this code. And he's got an example of the main function, and he says, let my variable equal by print, and he's got a mac, he's got the print line macro in my variable. And ah, so he's, he's got something which is, so by default, your code should work as, um, okay, okay, sorry, I, I, see, I see what you're trying to express there. Uh, however, by the code which you've written, um, unless I'm going crazy, that shouldn't work, as your variable that you've declared is immutable. So you should not be able to change it. However, the point that you're trying to express is that uh, the let keyword is dynamically uh, typed. And uh, by default, there is no, um, I guess, one type for that variable like you might see in other programming languages. So to address that point a little bit more, um, basically what Rust does is it statically analyzes your code. So the compiler has a static analysis engine in it. Now... Essentially what it does is, so if you assign it a string the first time around, then the type of my variable will be a string. However, after that assignment, what will happen is the type of that variable will change. Now, this isn't like C-sharp where this happens in memory at runtime uh, in the in the compiler. What actually happens is you're actually creating a instance, uh, two instance variables there. So you've got the first one which is a type of a string and then behind the scenes you've actually got another one which will have another reference behind the scenes and that will be a different type. So what the compiler is doing is basically saying well this one's a string, this one's an integer um, and you're redeclaring the variable. Uh, and then obviously he's just reprinted it out twice to express the point. 
The next, the next comment that also comes from him, which is, which is his final comment, he says, you should use cargo new dash dash bin my program if you want to create a new repository for your program. By default, cargo new creates a library template. Uh, this is correct, however, um, I haven't found this completely necessary to mention yet, but we will be getting into that uh, as we go into distributing uh, your applications in Rust. But thanks for the comment anyway, um, and I actually did learn something else by Googling what you wrote there, so that's awesome. Uh, Derpy Flamingo comments a little bit along go. He says, um, I don't know how the hell the batch got in there, Lameo, but never mind, I'll just follow the tutorial. Yeah, guys, try and watch the tutorial before you, uh, you know, <laughs> before you go and comment on some uh, weird stuff. Uh, the, the video that he commented on was actually in C++, go figure. I don't know how he got batched from that, neither does he, apparently. But, anyway, um, it wasn't a botnet, it was an IRC client, so... Uh, Alexandros Pappas uh, asks, is there a converter for CSS to QSS? Uh, the answer I have, I have so far seen is no, however, um, that doesn't mean that there isn't, uh, but it's not really a necessary thing to have as uh, QT style sheets use uh, pretty standard CSS, there's just some things that you can't do. <clears throat> uh, and the final comment that I want to go through uh, quickly is uh, Paul M. Bendrix, uh, Bren Brendixson, sorry. Uh, he mentioned a really good comment, which is actually uh, probably the most insightful thing that someone's ever mentioned on my videos. Uh, so I do want to go into that quickly. He says, uh, okay, just uh, two small comments. Your line with Q application A uh, is actually what Scott Myers calls C++'s most vexing pass. <clears throat> For you guys who don't know what C++'s most vexing pass is, I didn't either. I would really recommend go looking it up, like he says. Uh, it's really, really important to understand. What you do here is that you declare uh, that there is a function that A that takes no parameters and returns a queue application. The reason it doesn't buff is that you never use A, uh, that you never use your queue application. Uh, you commented it out in the beginning. It would be my bet that you could safely remove the entire QT part uh, and just use uh, QT Create as your ID. 100% uh, correct, actually. Um, so he was more correct than me. Uh, I do want to get back into SSML, but I definitely want to finish these tutorials first. Um, and then he's got a whole bunch of uh, fairly te uh, technical stuff in there, which you guys can read the comment yourself. Uh, by the way, you mentioned something about bad code when declaring IGB. Bad coding is usually declaring multiple variables on the same line and not assigning them when declaring them. You might end up in a bad spot when uh, refactoring or commenting stuff out. Yeah, I just I just don't like declaring everything on the one line. Um, I can't remember what I did in that tutorial, but that was probably what I was uh, mentioning. Anyway, so this has gone on for now seven minutes, but uh, the next part of this is the tutorial, and I will obviously put some links so you guys can skip ahead of this if you want. Uh, so, yeah, this tutorial is on characters in Rust. Enjoy. Okay, welcome back. Uh, if you're just joining us for this part, I'm a bit wise guy, but uh, I'm sure you're not. Or at least you'll have watched the very first part. Realize, nah, I don't want to watch all this and skipped over it, and that's fine. Okay, so, um, this tutorial is obviously about the car type. Now, before some of you uh, pull out your shotguns and I find myself on the business end of them, um, some of you might say car, some of you might say char. I say car because it stands for character. Uh, I've never heard anyone in my entire life say character, uh, but I mean, depends on where you're from in the world. I've heard some developers say char, a char type, um, but I would call it a car type. Anyway, doesn't really matter. What's important is how we use and implement the car type. So, uh, ripping straight out of the Rust book uh, to make sure that we're 100 and 10% correct is the following. The car type represents a single Unicode scalar value. You can create cars with a single tick. Unlike some other languages, this means that Rust's car is not a single byte, but four. Okay, so let's break down that first sentence. The car type, so we know that the type is car. It represents a single Unicode scalar value. Well, a Unicode is a computer industry standard, and I'm also taking this off Wikipedia, so uh, thank you Wikipedia if I'm wrong. Um, but the definition as defined by Wikipedia is the Unicode, uh, sorry, Unicode is a computing industry standard uh, for the consistent encoding representation and handling of text expressed in most of the world's writing systems. So, to simplify that, so I don't look like I'm just ripping things off the internet, um, which I totally am, uh, 
it basically is is basically a way of uh, everyone being able to read a certain language. So, if you take for example uh, the English language. We have the alphabet, which is alphanumeric characters A to Z, and 1 to 9. Now, <clears throat> if you think about that logically, you have to have a way of expressing between every single person in the world uh, these characters. So, so everyone has to be able to read these characters. So how you define that is uh, by hex codes, or Unicode characters. So essentially, each letter on the keyboard is represented by a code, and it's normally something like 0x01, 0x02, blah blah blah. And to a computer, that means, okay, if I see, and this is not, ex this is not actually the correct codes, but if I see 0x01 on the, uh, on, on the, in my code, or wherever I'm expressing that, uh, that value, it tells the computer to display that character. Okay, so what is a scalar value? Um, and is it really important to this understanding? I would say no, not at all important. But, I will explain what a scalar value is anyway, in case any of your curious minds are taking over going, what's a scalar, what's a scalar, what's a scalar? Um, so, a scalar value, in the simplest way I can put it, is just a single value. Now, when I say a single value, that might be the number 1001, it might be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, it might be pretty much anything that is a single unit. So. Uh, for example, it would be one apple, right? Or it might be an apple pie. So anything that you could consider one, right? A single thing. Non-scalar would be something like a matrix uh, or a matrix or an array where you have lots of different uh, values in that um, uh, container, if you will, right? So it's a single container versus a multifaceted container. Uh, and I've probably just destroyed English, so come on, rack your shotguns or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so, the next important part of this is, unlike some other languages, this means that Rust's car type is not single byte, but four. So what does that mean? Well, it means not only can we store Unicode values in it, but Unicode, sorry, not only can we store normal letters and numbers in it, but we can also store some pretty interesting things. We can also store things like a heart symbol, we can uh, store Japanese characters in it, and we can, inst we can store a lot of different characters uh, that don't just take up a single byte, but instead take up four. So a lot of languages uh, and a lot of different kinds of... Um, symbols and stuff that you might find uh, floating around the internet, uh, they don't normally take up one byte. They normally take up four. They're Unicode characters. So if you ever see a little square on your computer uh, and you're unable to render a character, it's probably because it's Unicode and whatever you're using uh, to, to view and render that uh, font doesn't support Unicode. Uh, and just so that I'm, I'm all about referencing and making sure everyone gets their credit. Uh, you can find more information about uh, the char type in the standard library documentation, which is uh, slash std uh, slash primitive dot char dot html, which is on the uh, Rust documentation website. Okay, so now I've got that spiel out of the way. Let's get started. So, I don't actually have uh, in front of me any 4 byte characters. So I won't be using those, but you can just trust me that if you pull, uh, like in the Rust doc, you, if you use a hard character, uh, you'll have no problem storing that in the uh, car type. Anyway, so, without further ado, let's go ahead and we will scaffold our project. So we'll say, cargo new uh, char underscore data underscore type and okay so we've got our new project just there nice okay and we will just clear our console now you may have noticed that um i have an editor open behind the scenes you're like why would you do that i like the terminal it's green well um i'm actually in the process of moving a lot of my work over to the atom editor it's really nice go check it out it's hackable uh has really nice intellisense syntax blah 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 so um I will not be using the terminal for anything that I don't have to anymore, which includes uh, typing out code. So let's go ahead and minimize that. And inside the source, we will be saying uh, new file, and we will say main.rs, like we normally do. And we'll say fn main. And look at that, you guys have this awesome syntax highlighting. So we'll say let blah equal to Hmm, we'll say 
let blah equal to um, foo. Actually, no, we'll say let blah equal to foo, f, sorry. Um, and we will say print ln, and we'll say blah. Okay, so let's just run that to make sure that it builds and runs, and that we haven't got any weird uh, things going on here. So we'll say cargo run. Ah, whoops. So we should go into the next directory, which is char data type, and we'll say cargo run. And there you go, so we have printed out the F character type. I'm very sorry about that, I just went and paused the video uh, to make uh, some minor checks on something. And in the process, I also went and got a 4 byte character that we can use. So, continuing on. So the next thing that we can do with the car data type is, as we can do with every other type, we can use the little semicolon and we can define the type explicitly. So we can say, let blah, and the type is char. Now, when we save this, what we'll do is we will go ahead and we will compile this. So we'll say cargo run, and as you can see, uh, everything is still working as expected. Now, I want to demonstrate the difference between a string and a car type. Now, if you remember, a string can hold as many characters and whatever else you want to throw into it as you want. Well, the, one of the reasons that I'm using Atom is to quickly demonstrate the errors that will come up so that we don't have to compile every time. I have a uh, Rust linter installed, which basically tells me what I am and am not doing wrong. But to demonstrate what you can't do with a car data type, I'm going to put some more characters in here. So I'm going to spam my keyboard and I'm going to save this. Now you'll get an em you'll get an error if you're using a half decent editor. It'll say character literal may only contain one code point. So how did it determine that I I'm not allowed to do this? And what does that little thing on the end mean? Well. In the Rust documentation, it specifies that a tick is what specifies a char, or a car, depending on where you're from. <clears throat> so, essentially, when my editor sees these little ticks, if you want to call them, or single quotes, it goes, hey, character literals can only, can only contain a single character. So the idea being that a char, or a car, only contains a maximum of four bytes. So even if you don't use four bytes, it still has to have a maximum size of four bytes because the potential to store something that is four bytes long uh, is always there since the type supports it. So what you can't do is store eight bytes or, th or six bytes or two bytes in it, right? Well, that's not entirely true. You could store two bytes, but it has to be a scalar value. So storing two things into there would make it an array and no longer a scalar value. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to use a 4-byte character. Now, I've ripped this off the internet. It's kanji. Uh, I have absolutely no idea what it says, and I'm really sorry if it's something offensive. I doubt it is, but um, I took it off Japanese.stack.exchange. So let's go ahead and let's use it. So we'll say let uh, kanji equal to this character. Now you might notice my ID is still complaining um, and that's because um, <clears throat> I didn't save so the Rust linter only updates on save so um, before you guys get your rage keyboards out which you should do at the end of my videos not midway through um, but yeah so it only updates once I save. So we'll say let uh, we'll say we'll print the kanji variable out we'll save the lint is all happy with that which means it's gonna run so uh, now I know before I'm compiling, and as you can see, uh, my terminal doesn't support Unicode, which is a real shame. But if I had a terminal that supported Unicode, it would print out this character as this kanji character. So, that's actually all there is to uh, the car data type. Uh, I've literally covered, I think, absolutely everything that there is to know about the car data type in Rust. This has been a really long video. Thanks for watching, guys. Rate, comment, dislike, like, subscribe. Uh, punch a hole in your computer that it doesn't compile, download the nightly compiler of Rust and feel the wrath of bugs, whatever you guys want to do, um, you know. Uh, but anyway, stay tuned. Um, the next video will be on the numeric types in Rust. So, 
uh, peace and have a good rest of the week. Ah, I forgot to mention, I am going away uh, in the next couple of days, so um, I probably won't be getting any more videos out again for a while, uh, but I will try and record some over the week and I'll put them on a schedule to be released. Assuming YouTube doesn't screw that up for me, then we should be all good. So, thanks.